so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hey there, I just wanted to give you a heads up today before we get stuck in that this episode is a heavy one. The conversation contains discussion of child sexual abuse, rape, torture, drug abuse. It is a particularly violent story and it might not be for everyone. So with all of that being said, here is today's episode. It's January 2016. The summer sun has been beating down on the town of Waruli in rural northeastern Victoria. With temperatures soaring into the mid to high 30s at this time of year, police have entered day six of their gruelling search for local woman Karen Chikuti. The 49-year-old hasn't been seen since Tuesday the 12th of January. CCTV footage placed the mother of two at the local supermarket earlier in the day before she visited the local pub that night. But when Karen didn't show up for work at the rural city of Wangaratta Council the next morning, alarm bells were raised. A former publican turned council record keeper, Karen Chikuti was a well-respected member of the community, a popular and familiar face amongst a tight-knit town. So when she vanished, the town and her two teenage children grew increasingly anxious. Their fears intensify with the discovery of Karen's burnt-out car in nearby Myrtleford four days after she was last seen. By Monday the 18th of January 2016, the search for a missing person has pivoted to the search for human remains. A man called Michael Cardamoni is already in custody. He was arrested the day earlier in connection with Karen's disappearance when the search for her body leads investigators to Buffalo Lake off Cropper's Creek Road near Myrtleford. It's been 188 days since Michael Cardamoni was released from prison after serving six years behind bars for the rape of a 15-year-old girl. 188 days since he moved in with his elderly mother, next door to Karen Chikuti, her 15-year-old son and her 14-year-old daughter. On the 18th of January 2016, six days after she said goodbye to the familiar faces inside the tiny Warali Hotel, Karen Chikuti is found dead. In breaking news, I can confirm that police have found the body of missing mother of two, Karen Chikuti. Now, this comes after her neighbour, Michael Cardamoni, was led into Wangaratti Police Station. The conduct in relation to the murder of Ms Chikuti was extraordinarily vicious, callous and thoroughly unprovoked. The crime you committed was, quite simply, horrifying, depraved and disgusting. The 50-year-old has never revealed why he killed his innocent neighbour, nor shown any remorse or regret. And for that, he'll never walk free. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. When 49-year-old mother of two, Karen Chikuti, left a Warali pub in 2016, she was expecting to return to an empty house. With her two children staying at their dad's that week, the predictability of an amicable custody arrangement provided the perfect timing for the sociopath next door to isolate the woman who had rejected his romantic advances. Alone and defenceless, Karen was abducted, raped, tortured, and eventually murdered. After the arrest of Michael Cardamoni, it came to light that he was a convicted child rapist who'd been released from jail on parole just six months earlier, raising questions within the community about how another Victorian woman could be killed at the hands of a man who'd already proven themselves to be a violent offender. The unprovoked attack on Karen Chikuti was described as so unfeeling, 
so excessive and sadistically executed that those prosecuting Michael Cardamoni worked to make sure that unlike the last time, he would never walk freely amongst the community. Michael Cardamoni will die in jail. The Chikuti family's lawyer, John Suda, was in the courtroom in 2017 when a landmark ruling was handed down that declared brutal murderer Michael Cardamoni has no right to appeal his sentence of life imprisonment without parole. John believes gross negligence allowed a dangerous offender who was basically left unsupervised, unmonitored and to his own devices to murder a beloved mother and friend and that more should have been done to protect her. John joins us now. I want to start back in 2015. A man named Michael Cardamoni was in jail. Why was he there and when was he released? So Michael Cardamoni at that particular time was in jail for the rape of a 15-year-old girl who lived with a boyfriend in a caravan while he worked on a tobacco farm. So Catamoni was convicted on a number of charges. He was found guilty of threats to inflict serious injury and to kill, sexual penetration, committing an indecent act with a child under 16, and rape. The total effective sentence was 10 years and three months with a non-parole period of seven years. However, on appeal, that sentence was reduced to nine years with a non-parole period of six years. The orders of the county court at that time were that he be sentenced as a serious sexual offender and be registered as such for life. Did he have a prior criminal history to that? Was this an especially violent offender? This particular crime was his first serious violent crime indicating his propensity to harm women. Prior to that, he had extensive criminal history for theft, dishonesty and drug charges, including trafficking. Thanks to that appeal you mentioned, he ended up out on parole after only six years in jail. Where did Michael move to after his release? What was life like for him at that point? By January 2016, Karamani had resumed living in Warali, effectively unsupervised in terms of his parole and left to his own devices. Essentially, he lived in an adjoining property next to Karen Chikuti. Karen herself lived on that property adjoining Michael Karamani's farm on a 10-acre property. Michael Karamani was well known to Karen. Karen and her husband previously were the publicans of the Warali Hotel. The Chikutis were very well known amongst the locals at that period of time. And Katamoni in the early days was well known to frequent the hotel, as I'm told, drinking lemon squashes, but very much kept to himself. And so Mr Katamoni was well known to Karen many years before her actual unfortunate demise. Warali is a small country town, over 250 k's northeast of Melbourne, a population of about 400 people. So we know that it's quite a close-knit community. At the point when Michael Cardamoni is released and moves onto the property next door to Karen Chikuti, what was Karen's life like? She was very well respected within the Wangaratta and Warali community. Karen was only 49 years of age and she was employed at the time at the rural city of Wangaratta, working in the records department and had been working there for quite some period of time. She had two teenage children, a boy and a girl. And by then she was separated from her husband. This is the husband she used to run the local pub with. What was their custody arrangement? So in terms of custody arrangements, Karen had the children one week on and then Mr Chikuti, the husband, 
had the children the week thereafter. So it was a very amicable arrangement. Karen was a very decent human being. She was very popular in the Wangaratta community and the Wairali community and certainly amongst her work colleagues. I recall seeing Karen Chikuti every now and again at the Bull's Head Hotel in Wangaratta, which she would religiously have lunch with her colleagues there. It was only in hindsight that I recall that that lady who was full of life was in fact Karen Chikuti. Did the Chikuti family have anything really to do with Michael Cardamoni? You've mentioned that Karen would have been familiar with him, but was there any friendship or neighbourly relationship there? Not as such. Cardamoni had a long-standing drug dependency problem, and I think this was known to Karen as she did make comment to members of a family that she would find the likes of syringes, empty orange juice containers converted into bongs along the fence line of the adjoining property. It's very much unknown in terms of what Karen may have believed in respect to Mr Cardamoni's previous sexual offences against the young 15-year-old girl. In keeping with his profile, he embarked at that period of time on an elaborate path of lies in which he informed Karen that the young girl had witnessed on the kitchen table of Cardamoni's farmhouse a substantial amount of money in cash in which he said that was derived from illicit tobacco and that was excuse after an excuse in order to conceal the true purport of his crime in respect to the 15-year-old at the time. Is there a chance that Karen Chikuti might have known she was living next door to a convicted child sex offender? Should she have been told when he was released on parole? She would have been told, but again, it's the elaborate lies that Cardamoni embarked upon. Whether or not she believed those lies is unknown, but I suspect not. So with everything you've just described, would it be safe to say the relationship was probably more strained than it was friendly? I wouldn't say it was strained, but I think that Karen was very, very cautious. Did the kids give any indication that Karen had told them to, you know, avoid contact with him or, you know, stay away from the neighbour? Was there any of that that we know about? None of that directly, but she was very careful to supervise the children when she had them on her property. We now know that on the 12th of January 2016, Karen was murdered by her neighbour, Michael Cardamoni. It's a completely horrific story to recount. But, John, what can you tell me about Karen's final hours? Somewhere between 9.18pm and 10.30pm, Karamani physically attacked Karen Chikuti. Following the attack, he restrained Karen by binding and gagging her. It appears that Karamani left Karen in a shed on his property and at this stage she was still alive And if she was conscious, she must have been very, very frightened. At this point, it's understood that Michael was looking to score drugs. So he abandoned Karen Chikuti to go and purchase and consume illicit substances. It's certain that he was drug affected that night, but do we know what his drug of choice was? Amphetamines and the like. There was a concoction of a number of drugs. He had a very significant past history of drug use going back to his teenage years. He used drugs in very significant quantities. After obtaining drugs, Katamoni must have decided that he would kill Mr. Chikuti. And approximately 3.30 a.m. on that fateful night, Katamoni, in his Nissan patrol vehicle, drove to Murderford and had Mrs. Chikuti in the car. The evidence of the phone 
tower contacts indicated that two and a half hours elapsed while Kaurimati was in the Lake Buffalo area, about 20 kilometres from Murderford. It was certainly during this time that Kaurimati murdered Miss Chikudi. Having taken Karen to the vicinity of Lake Buffalo in the early hours of 13 January 2016 and using her skirt, cable ties and duct tape, he bound and gagged her. At some stage, Kaurimati administered drugs and injected battery acid into her. He inflicted severe injuries to her head and torso. The blows to her head caused a fracture of the skull to the right side and extended inside the cranium to the midline. Kaurimati fractured six of Karen's ribs and the signs of hemorrhage indicate that when this occurred, she was still alive. I've never heard of anyone being administered with battery acid, you know, everything that was injected into her at that time. Do we know much from the postmortem about what that can do to a person, what she might have experienced? Yeah, well, she was also administered with a heavy-duty vet drug. And so she may have been quite sedated, but notwithstanding that, she would have been horribly fearful. As Karen Shakuti clung to life, Michael Cardamone bound her, doused her with petrol, and set her alight in a final callous act that would ultimately kill her. The presence of chemicals found in petrol were identified in parts of Karen's body, revealing she inhaled these toxic vapours whilst she was still alive. According to the forensic report, the inhalation of gases and associated thermal injury and deprivation of oxygen caused Karen's death, coupled with a severe blunt force trauma to the head and torso. After Karen had died, Kaurimati was still not satisfied and used his four-wheel drive vehicle to drive over her body, causing injuries to other parts, including fractures of her vertebrae, pelvis and scapula. Having done these horrible things early in the morning on 13 January 2016, Kaurimati returned to Murderford and then on three occasions thoroughly washed his vehicle at a car wash in Murderford. The alarm is raised quite quickly that Karen is missing. As we've mentioned, this is a small town. She is well-liked. So Karen's absence is, you know, noticed almost immediately. How does Michael respond to that? He approached some members of the police force and told them that Karen was at his place sometime 9pm in order to obtain cherry tomatoes. That was obviously intended to give an innocent explanation of his contact with her and to corroborate his story. He actually placed a container of those tomatoes in her refrigerator. Notably, however, the container bore only his fingerprints and not hers. Later that night, Katamani again went to Murderford in order to obtain drugs. He saw Eddie George to obtain those drugs. George, who became a prosecution witness, agreed to assist in destroying Karen Chikuti Citron. George agreed and ultimately sometime after 4.30am on 14 January 2016, Katamani took Karen's vehicle to a location in Halls Road near Lookout Hill close by where she was found where the vehicle was later incinerated. Having done that, Katamani without any regret took every conceivable action to avoid responsibility for Karen's murder. The callousness on any view of Kadamani's conduct and lack of any regret was extraordinary in the circumstances. Everything he said to the police was designed to divert them from the truth to protect him from being charged. Was Michael Cardamoni suspect number one from the get-go, given that, you know, if investigators looked across the back fence, they would have known that this was a missing woman living close to a violent, convicted child sex offender? The police interest in Katamoni was very quick. He was the primary suspect. Did he cooperate with police in the early investigations? Not at all. He embarked upon an elaborate series of lies in order to cover up what actually occurred. 
What Kalamani said about Karen Chikuti's death on the 18 occasions he provided explanations were all designed to mislead police and, in fact, incriminate others. As the days went on in the aftermath of Karen's disappearance, Michael Cardamoni's lies continued and escalated from the bizarre to the sinister. From the story that Karen had dropped into his house to pick up a punnet of tomatoes to contacting his solicitor four days after she vanished to report that he had been kidnapped by two men. Police were able to track down Michael Cardamoni's car in the Melbourne suburb of St Kilda, where they apprehended him and determined that the kidnapping was a completely false allegation. Michael told police he was being targeted by a Lebanese crime gang and that the same gang was targeting Karen Chikuti. He said the gang had been making threatening phone calls that they would hurt his family before they took Karen and tied her up. Michael Cardamoni continued with his web of deceit throughout the entire police investigation, placing the blame on Eddie George, the Myrtleford man who helped him burn Karen Chikuti's car under the pretense it was an insurance job. Michael claimed he'd watched Eddie George kill Karen and that that is how he knew where her body would be. But the contradictory nature of his stories, coupled with his criminal record, meant police weren't willing to accept his fabrications. What transpired after that, Emma, was that Cardamoni was charged with the murder of Karen on the 19th of January 2016. Cardamoni was aware that Eddie George had made a statement to police about his assistance Cardamoni in destroying Karen Chikuti's car. So whilst in prison, Cardamoni became friendly with another prisoner at the Melbourne Remand Centre, known as BC, and he began to discuss his circumstances and the case with him. In conversations with BC, Cardamoni originally told him that the killer of Karen Chikuti was Eddie George and he simply was present when it occurred. However, Cardamani told BC that he had murdered Karen Chikuti and that he had a sexual interest in her. He gave a very detailed account to BC what he did and why he did it. He also told BC that Eddie George's only involvement in the matter was when Cardamani and George incinerated Karen's motor vehicle. Cardamani well knew that George had spoken to the police and that he was a prosecution witness. To his credit, BC passed on the information to police. The result was that counter money was later provided by BC a name and phone number for a man who would kill George for a price. Counter money no doubt thought in his own mind that three can keep a secret if two are dead. However, the man was in fact a covert police operative. Cardamoni came to know him as Matty Thompson. He had several conversations with Cardamoni, including visiting him in custody on 6 March 2017. The arrangement Cardamoni reached was that George would be murdered by Thompson and that his death was to be made to look like a drug overdose suicide. George was to be forced to write suicide letters confessing to the killing of Mr. Cutie. He provided details of where George could be found. Cardamani promised to pay Thompson $25,000 for the killing of George and given that he was in custody, that money was to be handed to Thompson in two halves by his mother, Maria Cardamani. Michael's mother, Maria, was actually arrested for this involvement and charged with perverting the course of justice. It's believed she didn't know the full extent of Michael's crimes, but she understood enough that the result of the payment was to throw police off the scent. So now Michael has the charge of Karen's murder hanging over him as well as this attempted murder plot against Edward George to cover his crimes, both of which indicate a blatant disregard of the value of human life. Did he ever show any remorse for the crimes he was accused of? The conduct of Carter Money over the entire period commencing toward January 2016 and concluding with his plea of guilty of 30 June 2017 was extraordinary and devoid of any regret or remorse. He only pleaded guilty when he 
became well aware of the very strong case that the Crown had against him. And as such, he had no choice but to otherwise plead guilty on the eve of his trial. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with lawyer John Souter about the murder of Karen Chikuti. Based on what happened to Karen at the hands of Michael Cardamone, every murder is horrifying, but this case in particular is incredibly violent, unbelievably so. In your experience, have you ever seen an offender like this? Not as brutal and callous. No, I haven't, Emma. On any view, Cardamone's conduct in respect to the murder of Karen was extraordinary vicious, callous, and thoroughly unprovoked. The crime committed by Cardamani was quite simply horrifying, depraved, and disgusting. In his sentencing remarks, Justice Lazary commented that he had ceased to be amazed at the level of violence that some men are capable of inflicting on defenceless women as a judge of the Supreme Court. But what he did to Karen Chikuti over a number of hours and for no apparent or logical reason, indeed amazed his honour, Justice Lazary, particularly against the background that Justice Lazary is a very experienced senior member of the Supreme Court and had conducted many, many murder trials over the course of his career. Given what we know about his crimes, what has been said about the mind of Michael Cardamone, what do we know behaviourally, psychologically about the mind of a killer like this? Well, certainly not one ounce of remorse, not one. His plea of guilty only came about when he knew about and realised the strength of the Crown case against him. What leads us to that conclusion then is that there was no realistic prospect of rehabilitation. Now, ultimately, Justice Lazary noted that to refuse to fix a minimum term is an exceptional step and is a dreadful punishment. But this was a horrible, dreadful crime. His Honour noted that civilization is judged by how we treat people like Cardamone and sometimes mercy is appropriate. However, Sometimes, as in this case, a crime is so horrific, so cruel and so callous that a step towards mercy becomes too difficult to take. Correctly, Justice Lazary refused to fix a minimum term and accordingly Calamone will die in prison as he deserved to and a much more comfortable life than Karen had during her horrible demise over those hours. And undoubtedly his demise will be nowhere near the cruel, horrible death suffered by Karen. Michael Cardamone will die in jail, as you said. He is the first killer in Victoria without a previous murder conviction and who pleaded guilty to receive that sentencing. How significant is that precedent, especially given that there is a perception that a guilty verdict often means you know, a discount or some sort of bargaining on the sentencing. How big of a deal is that? And do you think he would have seen it coming? Well, having said that, Emma, if he had admitted to his crimes early in the piece, that may have gone some way to a reduction. But to plead guilty on the eve of his trial and only knowing at that stage how strong and watertight the prosecution case was against him, that in itself bodes against any remorse that he pretended to express and correctly his honour declined to effect a non-parole period. What happened during the trial when that ruling was handed down? Did he seem shocked, perturbed? I was there and I looked him in the eye at the time that the sentence was pronounced. He did not flinch. 
What was it like for you being in the room at that point, you know, having spent your career in the legal and justice system, having an unprecedented sentence like that handed down? Can you talk me through that moment? I must say it did have a personal effect uh, on me, particularly given that I acted on behalf of the Chikuti family, very decent family, very decent children, having spoken to them in a lot of detail about the effects that the death of a mother has had upon them, it did have a substantial emotional effect upon me. What must it have been like for Karen's family, not only that a beloved mum disappears, but coming to terms with what had happened to her? Do we know a lot about their experience? Whilst the effects of Karen's death upon the children may diminish somewhat with the passage of time, it will never leave them. It can't. It just can't. Obviously, you know, to be there in the room representing this family who've lost their mum in such a horrific way is, you know, no one wishes to be in that situation. But was it a sense of relief? Was it also victorious, you know, knowing that you were part of that? Victorious in the sense that he got what he deserved. But again, having said that, he's spending the rest of his life in Barwon Prison. All right, he's incarcerated, not allowed out of his cell for 23 hours per day. But he's got a bed, a TV and three square meals a day. Much better than what Karen ultimately saw at the age of 49. Has he made any appeals? He did. I have carefully looked at his honour, Justice Lazarus' decision, and my first thought upon reading it for the first time, it is that watertight and well-considered in terms of reasoning that it was unappealable, and if any appeal was to ensue, it would be subjected to spectacular failure, and that's what ultimately occurred in the Court of Appeal. They refused to overturn his honest reasonings in the first instance. John, you ended up representing the Chikuti family throughout this ordeal. What was your involvement in this case? So initially I was instructed to uh, make an application under the Sentencing Act for um, compensation given that the state of Victoria had confiscated assets owned jointly by Cardamone and his mother, namely the Werali farm, and there were funds set aside to be distributed to victims. That was the first approach that I received from the Chikuti family. Thereafter, it was my advice to them that given the circumstances, Cardamone was on parole. He was left to his devices in Werali, unmonitored, unchecked, not checked by the Department of Justice in Wangaratta, there was a cause of action, in my view, against the state of Victoria in negligence for not properly monitoring him in those circumstances, allowing him to range freehold all over the northeast of Victoria, unsupervised and unrestricted. So I was instructed to investigate a possible cause of action against the state of Victoria. Once I was able to obtain Uh, documentary evidence, it became evident to me that it was a strong case. The state of Victoria conducted a robust defence to begin with, but once we obtained discoverable documents setting out the evidence, the state of Victoria very quickly and rightly so, being a model litigant, abandoned their defence and it was just a matter of me doing my best in respect to the members of the family in order to obtain as much compensation as I could for them, whilst they can never, ever alleviate their pain and suffering in terms of what occurred, at least it makes their lives somewhat comfortable. When we look to other high-profile cases that are perhaps comparable You know, the Frankston murders in the headlines right now, we spoke about on the podcast very recently, that he may be able to walk, he is eligible for parole, a serial killer. 
the murder of Jill Ma, you know, killed by someone on parole after he had raped five women. Michael Cardamoni on parole, you know, released from prison after raping a 15-year-old. Is there something bigger here worth interrogating in this country when it comes to the parole system? Yes, well, I think that there is systematic errors within the parole system. Having said that, it is difficult with the resources available to properly administer the terms of parole, but that is no excuse and it can't be any excuse. Why is it so complicated? I'm interested in, you know, your legal expertise and experience that for the everyday person we read these headlines and it just seems unimaginable that people can walk free after those situations. But what are some of the complexities in decision-making that we should understand? Well, some criminals are very cunning in terms of how they express themselves before the parole board, but one would have thought that members of the parole board would be able to see through deception and self-validation and self-justification and I'm a changed person and I want to live within the community as a law-abiding citizen and contribute to society. The reality is that the system has limited resources available to it. Given that Michael Cardamone was a repeat offender, he hadn't murdered anyone before Karen's tragic death, but he was sexually violent, he had stolen a history of drug abuse. Does that give us an insight into repeat offending and failures in the system to rehabilitate people in those earlier days of the more petty crimes? You know, I think there were some thefts when he was a teenager, stuff like that. Yes. Well, those convictions that he had when he was a teenager, they're all non-custodial. And what appears to have motivated him in terms of this horrific crime was a sexual interest in Karen and it appears from the evidence that she declined his advances and that really set him off given the circumstances. He was unable to accept rejection. Based on your time with Karen's family, what is most important to them going forward in honouring the legacy of their mum How do people want Karen to be remembered? As we all do in the northeast of Victoria, a very decent woman, well respected and very well liked within the local community. Thanks to John for his assistance in telling this story with us today. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. The executive producer of True Crime Conversations is Gia Moylan. Our audio design is by Rhiannon Mooney. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.